Fittingly, number one is the first photograph in our 47 preview. Arthur Reeler returns to the track at Quarterbridge after, presumably, making adjustments to his club and Excelsior. Arthur first rode the Manx Grand Prix in 1937. His last island race was the Manx Grand Prix in 1989. He was due to ride the 1990 Classic Manx, but a practice spill made him a non-starter. Artie Bell was making his TT debut in 1947, seeing he had taken his Garden Gate Norton round Governor's Bridge in practice. His subsequent performance in the Senior TT led to a place in the works team the next year. Jock West in evening practice on the AJS Porcupine at Union Mills. Ever wondered why the village was so named? The building on the right was both a corn mill and a woolen mill. The company was called the Flail and the Fleece United. Ben Drinkwater. He finished second in the 1946 Lightweight Manx Grand Prix but died as a result of a crash in the 1949 Junior TT at the 11th milestone, which was called Drinkwaters for a number of years before reverting to its original name. A major disappointment to TT fans was Freddie Frith's practice crash on the 500 Motor Guzzi. The front brake torque arm broke as he approached Bella Crane and he suffered a broken collarbone ruling him out of the race for that year. In 1937, Freddie had been the first man to lap the TT course at 90 mile an hour. I was fortunate to find this small snippet of film of the start of the 47 Junior. Number four is Ronnie Mead. Number six is Peter Goodman, director of Veloz Limited. Peter finished fourth after running low on fuel on the last lap and having to coast home. Getting the signal to go at 12 is Frank Fry. Number 14 is Only Lions who had won the 1946 Senior Manx Grand Prix in appalling conditions on his GP Triumph. He looks like he means business today. 23 is Roy Evans, getting a bit of a limpy start. He retired from the race. A high percentage of riders were mounted on pre-war machines. 34 is Les Higgins and 35 is Bill Webster. 41 is Bill Beavers who combined solo and psycho racing, swapping the engine from mount to mount. One of the few corners that doesn't look like it's changed in the last 70 years. Humphrey Waddington takes his KTT Veloset through Braddon Bridge. Dave Gregory takes his Norton through Quarter Bridge. It was to be his only TT race and sadly he retired. Peter Goodman peers into an empty tank. He was 81 seconds slower on his last lap than third placed Jock Waddell, but only 54 seconds down at the finish. For sure he could have taken a leaderboard position, but for that lack of fuel. He made up for it in the senior though. Ken Bills conducts a post-race debriefing. He finished a lowly 21st. His third and sixth lap times were significantly slower than the rest. Lack of fuel perhaps? In the berry is renowned Norton entrant tuner Francis Beart. A bunch of likely lads. I wonder how many of their great great grandchildren are these days manning the scoreboard.
The Leatherhead Club's Arthur Wheeler gets the first clubman's race underway. Of the seven entrants for the lightweight class, Arthur was the only one destined to retire. There was no age limits on machines for the clubman races, so Edgar Quine, not the former Manx politician, rode this 1938 Triumph Tiger 80 in the Clubman Junior. After a trouble-free practice, he was persuaded by a Triumph race technician to fit a 10 to 1 compression piston for the race. Not a good idea. It nipped up at Union Mills, again at Glen Helen, and finally expired on the mountain. With the fuel rated at just 80 octane, it was surprising he got that far. Five times Manx Grand Prix winner Dennis Parkinson only rode one TT, the 1947 Clubman Junior, and predictably he won it on his Inter Norton. Three of his Manx victories were pre-war. After retiring from racing in 53, he became a well-known commentator, particularly for the grandstand scrambles. Who remembers his favourite saying, the undulating straight? The outside curb in the Governor's Bridge dip held a magnetic fascination for clubman riders. Jack Terry, riding his aerial for the King's Norton Club, drifted a tad wide with the expected consequences. The marshals were well on their way even before he'd stopped sliding. He remounted to retire at the pits at the end of the lap. In the 60s and 70s, Jack Terry was well known in sprinting circles. Wolf Slatholm Governors. His third place AJS was alleged to be a comp shop special made exclusively for the Clubman race. It was probably very similar to the machine Les Graham used to great effect at Cadwall Park and Chelsea Walsh. Wakefield's Dennis Parkinson must have known his way round the island blindfolded with doing so many laps pre and post war. Seen here at Governor's Bridge Dip on his way to winning the 47 Junior Clubman race. Hilary Imunger Watts waits for the switch of the flag to get his triumph underway. The scoreboard behind him shows that the lightweight runners and the earlier junior machines had passed Balacrane. I am Unger Watts, entered by the Hampshire based club XHG Tigers, finished seventh on his Tiger 100. Jack Hannell gets underway on his triumph. He was delayed early in the race with a faulty fuel pipe union, but repaired it with a boot lace. I wonder whose boots they were. Hilary Imunger Watts recharges his Tiger Hundreds fuel tank with a few more gallons of 80 octane essence. If PH Waterman presses any harder on the rear brake pedal, He's in danger of turning right in the Governor's Dip. His 500 AJS was another of the Comp Shop Specials, similar to the smaller cousin ridden by Wilf Slatholm in the Junior class. A poor picture, I'm afraid, but he's the only one I can find of Eric Briggs winning the Senior Clubman. His machine was prepared by Steve Lansfield, who described it as a 1939 Norton Model 30 with a compression ratio of 7.4 to 1, 
standard cams and standard everything else. All I did, he said, was just to make sure that everything was right. Lancefield despised the term tuner. He preferred to be called an engineer. Jack Cannell eased his helmet off after the race. In 1935, he rode as an extra in the George Formby TT Classic, No Limit. I wonder if that is a young Geoffrey Cannell in the lower right of the picture. Irishman Manlift Barrington weighs in his lightweight Gutsy. Stanley Woods had persuaded Giorgio Parodi, boss of Motor Gutsy, to provide the machine. Barrington was to take the win in controversial circumstances. Barrington at Governor's Bridge. He was adjudged to have beaten Morris Can, but Contemporary reports indicate there was a minute's discrepancy in the race times of Barrington and Can. A protest was put in, but the results were upheld. Ben Drinkwater, seen here at Keppel Gate, finished a splendid third on his aged Excelsior, but over eight minutes behind the leading Motor Gutses. Morris Can at Governor's Bridge. Possibly robbed of victory in the 47 lightweight, he had his revenge in the 1948 lightweight TT. Ronnie Mead at Governor's. His Excelsior failed to last the seven laps asked of it. Post-race banter between the Dane Sven Sorensen on Excelsior number 15 and Irish veteran Paddy Johnson on his CTS number 14. Both had ridden the island pre-war. Sorensen had started his TT career in 1935. Paddy first rode here in 1922, winning the 1926 lightweight TT. Sven finished seventh, Paddy eighth, with barely 10 seconds between them, after 264 miles. Stanley and Mildred Woods congratulate Manliff Barrington after his victory. One of the new post-war racing machines was the AJS E90, which will always be known as the Porcupine, on account of its spiky fins. The machine, which was barely finished in time for the TT, was ridden by Les Graham and Jock West. Originally designed to be supercharged, the racing authorities banned supercharging after 1946 so the machine had to undergo much modification. Jock brings his machine up for weigh-in and parade it for the many photographers there. As good as the AGS might be, a firm favourite for the race had to be Harold Daniel, the current lap record holder at 91 mile an hour, set in the 1938 senior. This record was never in danger at the 47 meeting on account of the low grade petrol that was made available post war. Flying Ulsterman Artibel on 41 and Ken Bills discuss their prospects and then join Harold Daniel for a photo shoot prior to the race. Joe Craig, Norton's team manager for many a decade, takes centre stage. Ironically, Joe was the brains behind the original Porcupine project. Jock West at Governors. The machines were not developed or quick enough to match the Nortons. Jock hit trouble on the last lap. 
to finish 14th and last of the finishers. Humphrey Waddington on Bray Hill. The Garden Gate Nortons were heavy beasts and prone to cracking frames. It would be three more years before the Rex McCandless designed feather bread was introduced. Harold Daniel follows the arrow round the governors. Amazing to think that the fastest race of the period round the Titi Mountain course was turned down for national service on account of his eyesight and he spent the war in the Home Guard. An old Christmas remounts after a late race pit stop. He rode the Manx before World War II before heading to the TT. Despite what may have been a splash and dash at the end of the sixth lap, he still finished seventh. Mind you, there was only 14 finishers in this race. Peter Goodman did not suffer any low fuel problems in the senior on the Big Vallo, finishing third to the battling Nortons. This was his only TT meeting. He sustained severe injuries after a race crash in France and retired from racing to take up the directorship at Velos Limited. This TT winning lark is boring. Harold Daniel conceals his delight at winning a second TT with a yawn. His last TT win was the 1949 senior and he retired from motorcycle racing in 1950 and took to racing Formula 3 cars. Les Graham's porcupine spat its rear chain off just before the finish. Despite this hiccup he finished ninth. Two years later he was so close to winning the race but that is another story. A drag on a fag and a look of satisfaction of a job well done. Archie Bell reflects on his second place ride. Peter Goodman, number 69, is congratulated by his starting partner, Ted Friend, on number 70. Peter gained third and Ted fourth, but two minutes behind. The Norton team in celebratory mood. Winner Daniel on the bike, Artie Bell runner up, only Ken Bills retired. Standing behind Harold, in jacket and tie, is brother-in-law Steve Lancefield. The leaderboard of the final race at the 1947 TT shows the battle for the lead. Artie Bell led on the first lap, but Harold Daniel was victorious at the end of the seventh. This brings the curtain down on 1947 TT Revisited. Keep watching out for further TT Revisited vlogs. <laughs>